So let's start off tonight with the Parker Solar Probe and Patrick So. Patrick, what's the Parker Solar Probe been up to? Well, it's been up to a lot of things, but its primary mission is to study the sun up close. And it's uh, kind of slated to get as close as 3.8 million miles from the sun. That's as close as any uh, sun probe has ever got uh, to the sun. But it actually um, has an orbit that takes it close to the sun and then it and takes it far away from the sun. And uh, last year, it uh, made its third close flyby of Venus. It uses Venus uh, as a gravity assist to, um, to kind of fling it closer and closer to the sun with each uh, pass of Venus. Now, the probe has a very special camera. It's, uh, it's a wide field type of camera. And um, the scientists decided, well, we're going to fly around uh, the night side of Venus. Let's see what we can do. Uh, so I was kind of interested because I looked at the date of this flyby. And, um, and what I did was I went to eyes on the solar system and um, was able to duplicate what a Parker Solar Probe would see as it flew into the shadow of the planet Venus. And you can see Parker Solar Probe silhouetted against Venus and there's very starry backgrounds and stuff like that. Now, this is the picture that it took. And it is just incredible. Now, um, what we're looking at here is uh, Venus is in, you can see the planet Venus, and there's various areas where it's kind of dark and light. And you can see all those streaks, all those streaks are cosmic rays uh, kind of uh, being uh, entering into the detector of the camera. But the interesting thing is that, and very unexpected, that, uh, that the camera was able to see dark, a dark feature called uh, Aphrodite's uh, Terra, which is a highland region um, on Venus, but it's actually showing through the clouds now, the scientists were wondering about this and they said, what's happening here? Because our camera actually is only designed for visible light. Well, it turns out that this camera has a bonus. You can actually see and peer into the near infrared. And what we're seeing there is basically the heat uh, generated from the, uh, this enormous highland region, which uh, covers about two thirds of the planet, showing through the clouds. Also, you can see in the picture, there's an air glow there. This is the basically uh, the oxygen, the very little amount of oxygen in Venus's atmosphere, actually uh, recombining on the night side. And uh, when that happens, you get a little a release of light. So that's incredible. As a bonus, if you look at the starry background, there's Orion way down over there, uh, but it actually gives you a good confirmation of what we're seeing here in this picture. Because if we go back to the simulation, there's Orion in, in the picture, in, in this uh, eyes on the solar system. This is just really fascinating. So back to you, David. Thank you, Patrick. Um, that's some really amazing imagery coming from the Parker Solar Probe at Venus. Um, to see Venus glow like that and then to see Orion, um, that's a little foreshadowing actually. And folks, anyway, back, back to our next story. Um, SETI Institute. If folks don't know much about the SETI Institute, it is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This whole game was kicked off when folks realized, you know, we're beaming our radio waves out into space. In particular, the things that really we're doing, and everybody loves to talk about, I love Lucy and whatnot going out there, but what really is beaming out into space is mostly radar. The radar that is sent out there to detect those World War II bombers as they were flying around was sort of the first stuff that was beamed out there into space with really strong strength. You need to bounce it off a little airplane that was heading into England to bomb you. See, those signals would bounce off, come back, you receive them. Well, most of that radiation didn't hit the plane. It was headed off out into space. Now, if you were on a planet some far away distance and some star was in the way, that radiation hits you. Well, it has Earth's motion embedded into that radiation. And that motion of the Earth affects the signal you'd get. In fact, a, parks, a radio telescope like this one at the Parks Observatory in Australia can actually pick up the drift in frequency from something like a radar on another planet. And that's one of the things they go look for to see signs of intelligent life out there in the universe. First of all, the radar actually also sends most of its energy in a very narrow frequency range. You don't wanna blast a whole wide frequency range, just a narrow one, then you get it back and you get a nice clean signal. So that's what we're looking for. And it turns out that there is something kinda interesting going on from 
Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is the nearest star to us, right around four light years away. 4.26, I think, is the number, if I'm remembering. Uh, we might 4.3 if I round it to the nearest one. So they've called this the breakthrough listen candidate number one. It, it indeed is a candidate signal. In, uh, in April and May uh, last year, they had a signal. It was around for about 30 hours. The thing is, it didn't seem to come back. It was the frequency of it was about 982 megahertz for those of you that want to go searching for it. What was interesting about it is it did drift in frequency, much like you'd expect a signal coming from an extraterrestrial source. Maybe, maybe a signal coming from the nearest star. Well, you wouldn't think it'd be coming from a star, but maybe a planet. And indeed, Proxima Centauri does have planets around it. Can you imagine that? A planet and a signal, a radio signal? Well, not so fast. On the right-hand side, you can see their space weather discovery puts habitable planets at risk. Indeed, Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf. Red dwarfs give off a lot of x-ray flares, very energetic. They're tiny, but they're, they're sort of angry, I guess. You can think of it that way, the flares and things sending that radiation out, uh, even though it has two planets that are confirmed around this little red dwarf, and we think probably a ring of debris as well. Could there be life there, though? I don't know if I'm seeing any life in this image. With careful eyes, maybe you'll see a, a four, four-legged beast. Um, anyway, uh, Proxima Centauri is not alone, though. It's actually part of a three-star three star system. Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B are much bigger stars, and Proxima is very mildly bound to the other two. We think it's being carried along with them and on a kind of a long orbit, but very far away. However, Alpha Centauri A has always been a favorite of folks to wonder, could there be life there? It's a star very much like our own sun. Well, it has another star there though, which made people wonder, can you have planets around the double star system? Can you have that Tatooine, so to speak, where you got two stars up in your sky? Um, well, here's the actual orbit as viewed from Earth. Um, one is in the center here, Alpha is, uh, A is in the center, and then B, um, if you keep A fixed, moves around kind of like this. Well, if you unproject it, so tilt it so it's face on, you get the actual shape of the orbits. And you can see it's an ellipse. Sometimes it's further, sometimes they're closer together. This distance, the closest they get to each other, is about Saturn's distance from the sun. That's far enough away that you could pack some planets down in here. You could pack an Earth in there, and this one probably won't disturb it much. So could you? Well, let's look at the habitable zones around each of them. The green around uh, B, the blue uh, disc shaped the donut there around A. Uh, those are the habitable zones. And notice A's is very much like our own suns, 0.9 to 2.2. Earth would fit in there. You could, you could get a habitable zone, Mars out in the outer part of it. But you need the planet needs to be right. It needs to be big enough to hold on to the atmosphere, all the rest, uh, liquid water. But is there one even there? Turns out, maybe a candidate was found, a paper was published just recently where to nature astronomy, and that's a big deal, going up to the nature astronomy level. And you can see here, these are the two stars, A and B. The center, they've shifted the two stars relative to one another. I know I'm making laser points all over the place here now, but what they did is they had a star, they shifted the other one on top of it and subtracted it. Now the two stars aren't equally bright, which is why you get this dark area here that's over subtracted but it's a good way to give you a guess. You start out and say, well, you can roughly subtract these two things off of one another. Then you can make corrections to that, mathematical corrections, and you end up with something that didn't go away. Something's left behind. What would be left behind? Well, an object you don't expect. They did some work on that. How bright is that? Uh, would they be able to pick up something like Jupiter? Would they be able to pick up something like Earth? What about something like Mercury? A whole range of things in this paper. It turns out they think this could be roughly an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone around Alpha Centauri A. So it makes me wonder, uh, when we look at the map here, where everything is, our sun is the, the yellow disk there in the center, Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri a little over four light years away. Proxima Centauri, okay, maybe you don't want to go there, but maybe that flaring star has some interesting stuff you want to go gather. Maybe it's a civilization on Alpha Centauri A that hopped in their, you know, their star dump truck to go pick up some stuff and they're taking it back. All right, that's far-fetched, but things have gotten interesting in the Proxima Alpha Centauri A and B system. Um, so stay tuned for that. This is some some this is what I kind of live for. I love this sort of thing. I've always enjoyed the thought of 
could there be life out there? It's one of the reasons I'm so interested in our main topic tonight, the Perseverance mission, that we're going to go look for those signs of life on the surface of Mars. And you know, we'll talk more about that tonight, but maybe we're picking up signals. Stay tuned for that. We'll, we'll certainly bring you more of the story if they're really there. Well, Patrick, talking about signals, we've been getting signals from Jupiter, from a probe that's been at Jupiter for so, quite some time. Um, tell us what's been going on there after all, all this time out at Jupiter. Yeah, so uh, this probe is uh, NASA's uh, Juno spacecraft, uh, you can see in this uh, kind of artist uh, uh, conception here. Um, it's been uh, going around uh, Jupiter for, uh, um, it has an orbit, about 53 days for each orbit. But when it goes by Jupiter at a very close pass, we call that a perijove, and uh, it's done 32 of these. And I've indicated there PJ32, that's perijove 32, where the spacecraft can get glide as close as 2,600 miles above the cloud tops of Jupiter, traveling at a speed of 130,000 miles per hour. Now, it takes about two hours to go from pole to pole, and during that time, all its instruments are turned on, including the Juno cam, which continues to send us really spectacular pictures of Jupiter, some of the highest resolution pictures that we've ever seen. And here we're seeing a whole series of uh, ovals there. There's, uh, there's actually three of them surrounding a kind of a dark feature here. Let's take a close look at this. These are anti-cyclonic uh, features on, uh, on Jupiter. And they're uh, located in the Southern Hemisphere. And they're, they're in pre pretty interesting. And you can see all the cloud dynamics. Just as interesting are these vortices. Uh, and you can see these little white uh, clouds. Those are ammonia ice clouds, the kind of pop-up clouds that are visible on the tops of these uh, giant vortices. Now, this is another interesting feature that came across in uh, Perigeo 32. Uh, there's two vortices above a kind of a dark area. And you can see that dark area. And we, we have an actual close-up of that. Inside that dark area, that is actually almost like a, a version of a whirlpool in the clouds. And you can see basically it's, it's sucking the clouds down deep in below the cloud layers, cloud tops, um, so to speak, of, uh, of Jupiter. And uh, some of these features can be as large as uh, continents or as big as the United States. Now, we've only seen a few of these pictures, but, but there are many more which are processed by the public. These are kind of enhanced color pictures. And you can, you can find them on this website. Uh, so if you can't find this website, just go ahead and uh, type uh, Mission Juno um, in your search, and you can actually get to this website where you can see all these wonderful pictures. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for bringing that as I'm sitting here trying to adjust my color. There it goes. The camera's finally fixing its color temperature for me a little bit. Um, anyway, these pictures are really fabulous. And folks, if you want to take time to take down that web address, you can get that down, write it down, go take a look at them. I know we bring these pictures to you a lot, but these are some of the most dramatic, emotional pictures that the space program has brought since we were watching people bounce around on the surface. I mean, yeah, I love the rovers and things, but the public was unleashed on this imagery and told to go transform it. In fact, Patrick, you even have videos on our YouTube channel telling the public how to go do that. So go download your images, tweet them at us, tell us about it, and you know, get, get involved with Griffith Observatory 